Hey movie junkies, welcome back to Twin Flicks. Once again, I'm Paul, and we're here always celebrating the magic and art of cinema with you, and today is absolutely no exception. But before we get into the interview, if you haven't yet, consider being a subscriber and help this channel grow. So last month we had the absolute pleasure of sitting down with renowned cinematographer Polly Morgan. She has worked on different films and TV shows, but more recently she worked on the TV show Legion that was on FX. She worked on the film Lucy in the Sky that has a wide, uh, very various uh, different types of aspect ratios, and we talked about why the director chose to use those different type of aspect ratios and what they mean to the film. And of course, we talk about her newest film, A Quiet Place 2. Polly has also ushered in a new era of cinematographers, paving the way for many more female cinematographers to be in the forefront. It was a real treat talking with Polly and hearing about her experiences, and now we will be sharing that with you. So enjoy our conversation with cinematographer Polly Morgan. good thank you great great to finally meet you you too so where are you in texas uh fort worth fort worth yeah. how's life over there uh getting used to it still yeah yeah <laughs> it's you know we lived in a, a, a simi valley which is a suburb of la yeah so it's quite a culture change moving from California to here. Yeah, wow. And so many differences. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been there for now? Uh, 18 years. I think. Oh, wow. So let's go ahead and first start with um, uh, growing up. You were uh, born in, in the UK, right? That's right, yeah. I was born in the, the south of the UK, just um, about an hour or so uh, south of London. Okay. Did you, uh, were you raised there or how long did you stay there? So yeah, I, I grew up there and then um, I left when I first got to go traveling around the world. Um, I backpacked around the world when I was 18. So okay. um, yeah, I pretty much stayed there till I was, you know, 18 and then, and then do the next. Packing around the world, that's something so many people want to do and you had the opportunity to do that. It must have been amazing seeing all the different cultures and, and uh, people there. Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's a very British thing to do. You know, when mm. you finish high school, it's kind of like your baptism into adulthood where, you know, you get sent to the workplace and earn money for, you know, however many months you need to earn money for. And then you take that money and you go traveling around the world for as long as you can with it. and um, live very cheaply but yeah i just get to have some great adventures and to see the world before you then go on to further education or you know to to work in the big wide world yeah that's that's amazing must be a um a huge learning curve just to meet so many different people um when you were traveling around the world did you meet any filmmakers or or see any movie sets that you were allowed on that were filming at that time or no, you know, I never did. And um, sadly, you know, I'm a bit older now, so it was pre-digital cameras. And so it wasn't sort of that, that thing where now, you know, you're used to seeing all kinds of shoots happening all over the place because cameras are so much more accessible. Um, so I didn't, but actually I was in India and I did meet a film director in India. And then we ended up keeping in contact and that led me to return to India to do um, some work on a Bollywood movie. So, um, you know, it was a serendipitous meeting. Yeah, yeah. Get, some, get some experience with that. <laughs> Been a uh, fun and interesting experience. As a yeah. child growing up, did you uh, have a love for movies? Like, uh, what were some of your favorite movies or TV shows? Yeah, I mean, I think I was always kind of obsessed with TV and the movies. Um, 
it was you know something that we did as a family where you know we would go to the cinema together and, and watch new releases and it was always such a special time so I think movies just got a special place in my heart from a young age um I always remember I I love James Bond movies you know James Bond is such a big part of British culture that um we would always go as a family and see the latest release and um you know Spielberg was also just a huge inspiration you know just the pure magic and escapism of his films um you know they just they've stuck with me you know for my whole career and I think have always been a source of inspiration um but yeah so that but also you know I always remember my father telling me to you know get away from the television set because I was always um, known for getting up very early and I would be found glued in front of the TV when everybody woke up. So I think everybody knew that I was going to work in TV or the movies from a young age, but of course nobody knew. And I think my family still don't really know what a cinematographer does. Yeah. I, I have found in, you know, Paul and I, uh, we worked in the industry for close to 20 years. And uh, it's, it's interesting, you tell them that you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing that, and they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, okay. Are you going to be a director or an actor? Well, yeah. sort of. Yeah. <laughs> they just, um, so what, what was the, uh, what was, there, was there a particular movie or show that you saw where you said that that's what I want to do, I want to be a filmmaker? Um, I mean, I think I always remember seeing Close Encounters you know, when I was young and just kind of falling in love with that. Um, I also remember going to the theater and seeing Empire of the Sun, you know, and just being so drawn into the imagery and the experience of that young boy. Um, mm -hmm. And then even The Last Emperor too, that Storaro shot, you know, just being so taken aback by his vivid use of color. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that really for me, what it was, was um, not only having that love of film, and TV, but also um, I was really luckily exposed to a film crew when I was a teenager. Um, they came to our farmhouse, which was very remote in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they used it as base camp to do a feature film documentary on the composer Edward Elgar, who used to roam the fields and compose, um, you know, wow. in the, whatever century that was. Um, and I think for me to actually physically see a film crew and see a camera and they were very, um, you know, supportive of me wanting to look through the lens and, and be excited around the crew. So um, it was a very immersive experience for me and I think really just encouraged me in my pursuit of becoming a cinematographer because I think, you know, unless you really see it for real, sometimes the idea of this dream career is unattainable so for me it was it was very fortunate and kind of like just grounded everything in reality and just helped you know encourage me that it could be possible yeah definitely definitely now related to that when you finally did get your first job or whether it be a paid job or not first got your first gig what was that like to actually be on set and working on a set rather than just watching it was very exciting. I think my very first time on set um, getting paid, I, um, I was a PA and my, I remember my first job, I remember I couldn't sleep the night before, I was so excited. And then my first job was in the morning, I basically stood in a parking lot and just got to tell the crew that were arriving that a bus was going to be there any minute to pick them up. Um, and I did that for hours and I just literally stood alone in this parking lot, but still was thrilled. Um, to be part of it and then you know it was just so exciting to see it all take place and you know I was just you know always helping like I would offer to help the electron the electrics like you know coil the cable and you know I would empty the trash it was really just I loved it I just was so sort of mesmerized by the whole process yeah yeah I completely agree with that I can relate so much to that um, <clears throat> So when you finally, uh, did you want to be a cinematographer? Is that what you're aiming for? Or were you thinking of uh, another aspect of filmmaking? No, I, I really did always want to be a cinematographer. I mean, I think that, you know, working as a PA for so long, I worked as a PA for a couple of years. Um, you know, I think I was being drawn a little bit into um, production and the AD department. I mean, I did 
work in-house as a PA for Ridley Scott's company in London when I first moved there. Um, so I got to have that experience too, sort of seeing how the office runs, but I was never good with a printer or a photocopier or any of that stuff. So um, I was always sent to film the castings that would happen in the basement. Um, and I would like count all the short ends of film stock that they, they sat in the cupboard. So yeah, I would just always hang out with the camera crews and um, after a bit of time, they sort of um, offered for me to go and work with them as their camera trainee. And um, that's the wonderful thing about the UK is that we're not really a unionized industry as much as America is. So there weren't really any rules or liability or anything that would happen if I was just there for free, um, unlike there is here. So I really got to just go whenever I possibly could, when I didn't need to earn money as a, as a PA, you know, to just hang out with the camera department on set and just really learn the craft of being an assistant. And then um, once I kind of mastered all, all of that, um, they started hiring me as their loader and I would load the film and then I, you know, started working as a second. So. You know, I sort of worked my way up the camera department from being a, a PA to a trainee loader and then a second. And then um, after that, I went to film school. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's, that's such a common thing that so many people, you know, we, we did interviews with Dean Cundey and, and so many other people. And they all say to start at the bottom, you know, to uh, be on the sets, just watch people do what they do. <clears throat> Excuse me. You learn... <clears throat> You learn so much just by watching, and um, yeah, and, and you just grow. You get to see, maybe I don't want to do, maybe I don't want to be a cinematographer, maybe I want to be in lighting, or maybe I want to uh, do something else. And so, yeah, you, to be on a movie set, you learn so much, and you get a firm grasp on what you really want to pursue. Uh, did you go to film school in the UK or in America? So I came to America to go to film school. I went to um, the American Film Institute in Los Angeles. Um, and one of the um, cinematographers that I used to work a lot for, Harris Samba Lucas, um, <laughs> that, you know, shot Artemis Fowl recently and did the first Thor movie and many more. Mm -hmm. um, he was a graduate of AFI and, you know, he was just really encouraging and, and just, he saw me saving all my money to buy negative and, you know, pay for it to be processed. And he, he really saw me trying to do whatever I could to shoot. And he just sort of said, like, if you want to be 50 before you become a DP, you need to take this moment to go to film school. And it was wonderful advice because it was right when I went to film school that there was the, the real transition between film and, and digital. Um, oh. And so it was a really brilliant time for me to go because it really enabled me to handle that crossover because I was so familiar with film. And then it really allowed me to learn the technology of digital cameras, you know, as it was kind of coming out and being developed. Um, and, you know, I think my love of movies, I always kind of like dreamed of coming to America. And so I felt that coming to the States and pursuing a life here was really just the natural step. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And now you are now you're the uh, first female to be invited to the ASC and the BSC. You know, I'm very. Um, I try and be very active, especially within the ASC because I'm here. Um, the BSC, I find it's a little bit harder just because you know I'm I'm so far away. But mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a really exciting time. I think there's a lot more diversity within the industry and within cinematography, and I think. We have a long way to go, but I think that there is a real push to be more inclusive and to have a broad range of voices out there. So um, I don't think I'll be the only woman for very long. Uh, I hope not, because I think it's great. You know, it's such an inspiration for, for young girls to see that they can actually do something in that arena, to see you where you've come from, to see others... Uh, Catherine Bigelow and so many other female filmmakers. It's exciting because, you know, like growing up, I had no idea that all the movies that I was being exposed to were all shot by white men, you know? And I think it's exciting for us all and important for us all to, you know, be able to have access to stories told by all different types of people from all over the world. And I think that, um, you know, filmmaking is sort of the most accessible art form of this century. You know, it's an art form that we can all 
access and draw from and learn from. And I think, um, you know, we need to really just be more conscious of spreading the net and encourage young people from all walks of life to know that they can have a successful career in filmmaking. Yeah, definitely couldn't agree more. Now, uh, getting into more about the filmmaking, as a cinematographer, I'm sure you work with a director, uh, very close net. Um, how, how, how involved are you in creating or suggesting the mood, the set or tone of a particular shot that maybe the director isn't too sure what he wants? Uh, uh, as the lighting or just to set the pacing and the tone of the mood. How uh, involved are you in, in helping with that? Um, well, you know, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of what I do, you know, like I, um, I work with all different types of directors from first time directors to, you know, a lot more experienced directors. And if I'm working on a TV show, my relationship with them will vary greatly um, compared to working with the director on a feature film. Um, and, you know, when I'm in pre-production with a director, whether, you know, whatever that's in, I do obviously, you know, discuss the look and the feel of each scene and we look at references together, whether that's photography or other films or art or, or whatever it might be. Um, and we talk about, you know, the color palette, we talk about the mood of the scene, the emotion of the scene, like, you know, sort of really everything always comes down to you know, the story that we're telling and how we're sort of visually representing the arc of the characters in that story. Um, but, you know, I'm always given great freedom. I think directors, you know, work with cinematographers so that they can sort of talk a lot in prep about what the story's about and what the emotion of the scene is. And then they trust their DPs to kind of take that and then visually represent it on screen. So, um, you know, as far as shot design goes and shot execution, I think directors are very much involved in that. And that's a, a great collaboration between myself, the director and the operator, if there is one. Um, but as far as lighting the scene, you know, that's something where, you know, I just get to work and I do it. And, you know, maybe sometimes I might be given a note by a director, but often, you know, they just give me complete freedom. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I, I wanted to ask is how much freedom you have uh, being, being the DP and doing what you want to do. Um, have you, what, like, what's um, the most challenging aspect of being a cinematographer? Um, I think generally the most challenging aspect of being a DP is just always time. You know, like, it doesn't matter if you're working on a small budget independent film or you're working on a larger budget studio film. There's always factors that come into play which mean that you're limited in how long you can take, you know. So um, often you just have to really execute the work in a very timely manner. And sometimes that's challenging, you know. There's always a lot of work to be done in a day and, you know, it's, it's very important to be conscious of that and work with the AD. And I think, you know, no one wants to be on set for 16 hours a day. So it's definitely something where, you know, you wanted to get the work done and you really want to get the done, get the work done in a way that you feel proud of and you feel that it's executed in the way that you imagined. But trying to do that in a timely manner, I think is always a challenge for, for every DP. You know, it's, yeah. we're, we're always fighting the clock. Yeah, yeah. How, how um... Or the, have, have you seen much difference between how um, a production crew works between the, the UK or Europe versus an American film set? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Wherever you go and film in the world, film crews are always unique to that country. You know, it's like we talked about India. You know, it's a very different experience shooting in India than it is in the UK. And similarly, shooting in the States is different from the UK. And I think... You know, it's just sometimes the, um, the responsibilities of different HODs are different. You know, like in the UK, we don't really have key grips in the grip department. We have a camera grip who will help with camera support, but then the gaffer and the lighting department will really take care of everything else. Um, but, you know, there's subtle differences, but, you know, I think it's always like wherever you go in the world, going to a film set is always like going home because, you know, once you have a camera and you're doing the work, it's always a comfortable place. Yeah, going to a place that's, that you know and love. Yeah. 
and I want to talk more about uh, like your films, and I want to talk about Lucy in the Sky. Uh, we, me and my brother, we watched it yesterday, and some of those scenes are just so gorgeously filmed. Uh, you know, the where Natalie Portman is hovering in space, looking over Earth, and the lights from from the world. It's just, it's incredible. I just love those scenes. Uh, can you break down like how some of those scenes were shot. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting with Lucy in the Sky is, you know, I was very excited to do my first studio movie and by far it was the biggest budget um, production I had ever worked on at that time. Um, but, you know, we ended up doing all the space scenes and the underwater scenes in a, in a tiny stage in Burbank in just five days, just because, you know, like I said, no matter what you're doing, you're always facing limitations. So. Um, you know, we just, we just sort of talked a lot about it, um, in prep, the director and I, um, we talked a lot about interactive light and emotion and, um, you know, how we wanted to like convey her feeling of being, you know, in space in comparison to, to being on earth, um, and, and just to all keep it very subjective. So, you know, it's interesting. Every, every scene was just kind of filmed you know, in a normal way, but um, we shot with a DXL2, which is a large format camera, but we chose to put um, vintage anamorphic glass on the front, which gave it a very unique look in that um, you might have noticed that there's quite heavy focus fall off mm -hmm. around the edges of the frame, which, um, you know, especially these days with high resolution cameras to have everything so soft is kind of a unique feel. So, um, yeah, and I think Noah, who was the director, he gave me a lot of freedom with the lighting. Um, you know, it was definitely a sort of a more moody film at times. Um, but, you know, it was, it was just a lot of fun, really, just to sort of delve into this, this woman's emotional experience. Yeah, is that also related to the different aspect ratios that's throughout the film? Is, is, is that like represent her world shrinking or the the scent that she goes into, you know, standard 185, then you go to 133, then 240, and then that real ultra wide uh, yeah. shot a few times. Um, can you tell us about that? Like what, what, what made you, uh, you and the director decide on using such different, drastically different uh, widescreen formats? Yeah, so um, interestingly, when I first got sent the script, the aspect ratio shifts were in um, the writing and um, you know it was all about sort of representing her emotional state you know like when she's at work or she's in space she has this feeling of freedom and um, the world ex expands with the widescreen aspect ratio and then when she returns to earth or when she's in a um, sort of a certain point in the story where things feel like claustrophobic and intense you know the world kind of restricts and we close the frame down to you know, either a 4.3 or a 185 um, aspect ratio. And then there was a very unique aspect ratio that you, you noticed, which was actually an eight to one aspect ratio, which was extremely okay. narrow, um, which we achieved um, basically by tiling shots. And then the VFX department would stitch those shots together. Yeah, we, um, we were, when watching that, those scenes, we were like, what, what ratio is that? How did they do that? <laughs> it was a, a very clever use. Yes. I mean, the, the director, Noah Hawley, like, uh, he loves using aspect ratio as a storytelling tool. So if you, if you return to his work on the TV show Fargo or on the TV show Legion, you'll see that the aspect ratio is played with a lot in order to tell the story. Yeah, it is. Yeah, how, how did you and Noah meet? We met on Legion. Um, okay. so, you know, I, I'm, my agents put me up for the job and, um, I went to have a meeting with the producers, um, and the, the head writer and, um, they gave me the job on season two of Legion. I was an alternating DP with Dana Gonzalez, who shot the first season and also worked with Noah on Fargo. And, um, you know, they had been shooting in Canada, so they moved to LA and they were looking for a new alternating DP. And they got me the job and um, yeah, so I met Noah when I was working on that and, you know, I think that he responded to the work that I was doing on the show and then asked if I would be interested in reading, in reading the script. 
That's great. Yeah, the Legion, well, both Legion and Fargo, Legion, especially just such, uh, like the very, uh, to be honest, the very first time we saw it, we were like, what is this? Yeah. Really something completely different, completely new. We weren't sure if we were going to like it or not, but we kept stuck to it. As the seasons get further, they get more, I guess the term you could call it psychedelic. It's just yeah. such an incredible show. Um, uh, were you involved with the, um, like the I guess season, well, there's seven season two, but season three had a lot of the musical aspect to it. Were you, in, how involved were you with that? Or were you involved with uh, getting those shots as, as part of a musical? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the wonderful thing about Legion is um, the writing was so exceptional, you know, it's just so heady and so unusual. And I think, um, you know, going back to the topic of freedom, we really were given such freedom to be as inventive and creative as possible. Um, so, you know, I think the wonderful thing about filmmaking is it's just, it's such a collaborative effort. It always is, you know, and I think when you have great writers giving you such unique material and you have interesting directors that they kind of seek out to bring in that want to be bold with their choices. And, you know, then as a cinematographer, you get freedom to um, use new techniques and you have the money to back it up. Um, you know, all that stuff just really lends itself to some really fun filmmaking. And um, I wasn't involved particularly on the musical aspects. I only shot two episodes of season three because I had to leave to have my baby. Um, so I did just- That's good, they let you leave. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no they did. I mean, I did work up, I like, I think, I mean, I worked all the way till 40 weeks and then I just had to say to them, hey guys, like, I'm so sorry, but I just, yeah. I'm gonna have this baby for <laughs> um, How involved are you uh, in the script? I mean, do they, or do they give you the complete script or do they give you an episode at a time? Well, you know, I think that um, it depends sort of on whatever season you're working on. Sometimes the scripts, especially at the beginning, like I think, you know, when, when you start a TV show, they often have like maybe the first four episodes already, you know, written and, and ready to go. And then as you get further on in the season, you know, there's so much work that's happening that maybe you have to wait a little bit longer to get your episode, um, which is always fun um, and a bit daunting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think sometimes, you know, scripts can be too full and, um, you know, you just have to have conversations with the AD to say, are we able to pull this off in nine days, you know, because it's not very much time and if they need to cut something or they need to change something, you know, they often rewrite it, but um, never really are there camera angles or any sort of description of how things should be filmed. Um, so really it's just, you know, the story and the dialogue. And then as far as the visuals go, those are ideas that sort of come out of conversations in prep with the director. Okay. And, uh, you know, speaking of collaborating so much with the director and the AD and so forth, what about uh, when it's time to edit? Are you involved in any of the editing decisions? Or there, we talked to, like I said, Dean Cundy, uh, Fabian Wagner, who did Game of Thrones, they said that they love being in the editing bay. I have never been in an editing bay working with an editor. I mean, I would love to do that because sometimes it makes me sad what they cut out and um, the choices that they make. But, um, you know, I'm often, you know, as far as post goes, I always have a close relationship with the visual effects department. Um, and so I'm always talking about um, how, you know, the process of what we do on set and what they create in post, how that's gonna sort of tie in together. Um, and you know, the look of the images and all of that, like I'm very closely involved in that stuff, but the editing, not yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about, um, do you use much pre -vis? You know, um, uh, we used a bit of pre on Lucy in the Sky, um, but everything we did I remember it was sort of like pulling teeth. Um, you know, it was it was difficult because, you know, I've just, you know, had the opportunity to work with directors who really love to do things in camera as much as I do, you know, and like visual effects. Of course, there always are visual effects these days. Um, there's always kind of like a, a combo platter where you have to let visual effects take over. But 
for the most part, um, I've been lucky enough to, to work with directors that really like to create as much as possible in camera. Um, and so we haven't really needed to spend a lot of time sort of pre-visualizing the shots. Yeah, I thought that's one thing I also want to talk about is, is the visual effects aspect. Some people prefer working straight digital effects. Others people prefer practical effects. Um, have you worked on, you've worked on with both. Obviously you said that you did more, a lot of in-camera, prefer in-camera uh, or did in-camera uh, visual, visual effects. Um, how does that play for you as a cinematographer between digital and practical or which is more challenging? Well, you know, I think that um, there's so many factors that come into play when you're deciding whether you should do things practically or leave it to post. Um, often it's like just time, like I said, and it's sort of like if we do it practically and then we have to reset the effect, you know, how long is that reset going to take? And, and then we do it, you know, like how many times it's, is it going to take us to get it right? Whereas, you know, they could do it in post and you can have complete control. But you know, I love working with the special effects department on set and they're the people that do all the explosions and the atmosphere and they create all the interesting um, toys that you can play with to create different and interesting looks and feels. And then visual effects, you know, sometimes like on A Quiet Place 2, you know, we've got sort of creatures from outer space chasing our actors, you know, that, that has to be visual effects. And then, you know, you like just have to have those conversations on set how big is the creature? If this is my frame, am I chopping his head off? You know, sort of where is he going to be? And then, you know, often it's just a, it's a complete collaboration. So you have like the special effects people doing dust and, and sort of, you know, things being blown over practically. And then, you know, and that's the creature doing that. But then the visual effects people will put the creature in. So, you know, there's always a combination of, of, you know, practical effects and then some, some visual effects. And, and so it's always just a lot of fun working with, with all the different departments. Going back to Legion, um, did you, on the few episodes that you did do, were those more practical or, visu or, or digital effects? Or again, were they pretty much combined? You no, know, the thing is about working on a TV show like Legion is, um, you know, you will get a script which is very dense with um, unusual scenes, unusual locations, unusual actions that take place. And so, you know, basically at the beginning of each prep um, for each episode, we would have a round table discussion where all the HODs would sit in a room and we would go through the script scene by scene and, and read it out loud. And, um, you know, you kind of like, you have to figure out how you're going to do things. And so often, you know, no one has ever done anything like this before. So, um, for example, like on my second episode, you know, I have a woman in an igloo yeah. and um, there's fire in the igloo. And then there's a bright light that comes from the entrance to the igloo and she cools out and then she you know, is in a birth canal and then, you know, she's born and, and, you know, it's just these really sort of heady scenes that you're kind of like, okay, how do we do this? How, how does the design department build an igloo? How do we put the igloo in a believable world? Okay, well, we'll have fake snow and we'll have fans and we'll do this. And, you know, so there's so many things that you kind of like sit in a circle and you're like, oh, can we do this? Can, can you do this? And, you know, you just figure it out together. And I think um, it's a lot of fun, but as a cinematographer, I'm always actively involved in all of those conversations because ultimately I'm responsible for the images that you see on set. Mm -hmm. So if I'm reading a script and I need something to happen or I want something to happen or I'm thinking about how colors are gonna work together, I'm gonna go to the design department. I'm gonna say, I think it would be really great if, you know, the guy is lying on you know, mustard color bed sheets because I'm going to use a teal light source. And so I think the color contrast would be really beautiful and would fit this scene. And so they say, okay, cool. You know, okay. like we'll give you those, she those sheets. Otherwise they might provide any color sheets and then you get to set and you're like, oh, it's not really working with my ideas. So, you know, as a cinematographer, it's like you're sort of bouncing around the different departments that you work with and talking about, um, 
you know, how you want something to look and, and how you can work with them to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, and then choosing the different lenses. Show me. Sorry, my, my dog will calm down in just a second. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you were saying yeah. lenses. Yeah, lenses. Uh, how, how do you know which lens, is it, uh, for someone who obviously just starting out, how do you know which lens works for what shot? You know, it all depends on the feel that you're going for when you're in, in a pre-production and you're thinking about um, how you're going to tell the story. I think on Legion, you know, it was such a extreme show that we really embrace wide angle lenses, you know, like it was so, um, you know, like sort of quirky and fun um, that we often found just like the wide angle lenses, like super wide angle lenses really just, you know, photographed the scene and told the story in the way that we wanted to, you know, and really represented the character in that way and was able to contextualize the character in the scene. Because if, you know, if you shoot me on a close up on a wide lens, almost like my laptop is, you know, like you get to see me, but you get to see the whole world around me. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes you might work on a, on a different type of production, maybe a drama where you want the background to fall away and it's all about um, the character in front of you. And then you would choose, you know, a slightly longer lens, like a mid range, like a 40 or a 50. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like, as you get more familiar with different lenses um, and how they, affect what you're shooting you know you sort of just automatically make choices and I think you know as you get into filming something you know the lenses that you use all the time kind of just sort of magically come together and then you might find yourself using predominantly just one lens or maybe two or three lenses for the whole production. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, going, to, going back to Legion, I wanted to talk to you about someone who's quickly become one of our favorite filmmakers is uh, Anna, Anna Lily Am Amapour. Uh, you work with her on Legion, I believe? Yes. Yeah, like working with Lily was just, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a great time together. She has so many inventive visual ideas um, and she's also a very enthusiastic person to have around, you know, so the energy on set was always really good. And, um, you know, her mind just goes to a place which a lot of directors don't go to. So she was always pushing the boundaries as far as the visual goes. And I think that's really exciting, to, you know, type of director to work with. Yeah, yeah, I, I watching um, stuff on YouTube of her um, on set and interview, she just has this infectious energy that's just, just so great. And you can definitely tell she has such a strong visual style. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you saw a Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love yeah. that movie. Just, yeah. Uh, something I, I like to ask some people in, in uh, interviews is about music, is about uh, uh, film scores and music. You know, a lot of people who are in the film industry, they, they're huge fans of film scores as well. I wasn't raised on film scores. I don't necessarily listen to film scores that much, but I do use music as a big inspiration for my work. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about rhythm and pacing, you know, like when I'm prepping a movie, I can be inspired to put on a certain album that I know will fit the scene and it will just help me work. And I think sometimes, you know, when you talk to a director, when you're talking with them and you're like looking at visuals together, sometimes you can put on a piece of music too and you can connect and that can almost be, you know, a story building point just as much as like looking at photographic references. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you, uh, or depending on the director, I guess, how often do you use music on set to inspire? Um, you know, when I was a PA, I remember working on sets where they used music. And uh, I always thought it was such a phenomenal idea. But unfortunately, it's very, very rare that we use music. Sometimes on commercials, you know, um, like especially if there's children or something, they'll put music on and you just kind of like dance around with the actors with the camera and you can kind of get into that rhythm just to make people forget and feel more comfortable. Yeah. But often, you know, it's just not practical. What about Noah Hawley? Does he use music on his sets or does he? 
uh, prefer not to, or how does how, what's his method of directing? Um, I mean, no is um, such a inventive and and visual director that like often you know we'll we'll have a good plan in place. You know, I think it's always important to have a good plan in place when you when you get to work in the morning. Um, but he often would change the plan. He would have had like a brilliant idea on the way to work or maybe he dreamt about something or he, he suddenly had this flash of inspiration and then you know he would just say you know this is what I'm thinking and this is how I want to do it so to work with him was always very exciting and I think um, it definitely helped push me you know and it made me learn very quickly because some of the things that you know he would dream up was so grand and inventive and exciting but very complex as far as technical execution um so you know i think there's nothing i like more than being challenged and you know like being set a task and, and having to figure out how to do it so he would always inspire me in that way and yeah. um, you know it was, it was always very exciting so how do you how do you deal with that like say you're riding a car with him and all those things like you know let's not do this i got a great idea i just have have this you just came to me let's do this and this and this. Are you like, what? <laughs> are you like, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Let's figure this out. Um, you know what? I wish it was in the car, so it gave me more time <laughs> to think about it. But um, it was often just, you know, like every director, we, we get to work. It's always about the actors and the story first, you know? So you give them time to talk about the scene and block out the scene and, and figure how that's all going to work. And then, you know, like I would be watching everything that's going on and then he would come over and he would say, okay, so I'm thinking that I want to start close up on him in the room and then I want to pull back and then I want to do a 360 and then I want to push in and then I want to, you know, and I'd be like, okay, that sounds great. Um, I'll do that. I'll probably need two hours to set that up because mm -hmm. I don't have the correct head. I need to call someone and get someone to drive it over here and whatever it might be. Um, and you'd be, okay, great. And so, you know, I think it's interesting because I would always offer my suggestions, you know, of like, okay, well, maybe we would do this, but maybe we'd do this instead. And sometimes he would say, okay, great, I love it, let's do it. And sometimes he'd be like, no, no, I think my way is better. And, um, you know, that's my job. My job is to really sort of help directors execute their vision. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think when they have a burning desire to do something, I'm never going to be the person that says, oh, no, we can't do that. I'm always going to do whatever I can to make it happen. Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, it just, it will take a little bit longer. Um, and I think, you know, that is a challenging thing about working on wide lenses and moving the camera all the time is, it just becomes difficult for lighting. You know, like, how do you see everything and then move into a close-up of Natalie Portman and you want her to look absolutely beautiful, um, but you can't hide a light anywhere. So it's always just a bit of a head scratch and just sort of, you know, take a moment to figure out how you're going to pull something off. But um, luckily, I'm very fortunate. You know, you're always working with really talented and m motivated crew members who, if you have an idea, they can always help you um, execute it. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, that's 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 great to hear. You know, often more times than not, the more challenging something is, the better the result is. From what I found, because you're you're really striving to get something good, get something new and fresh, and and work at it instead of just yeah, okay, I'll shoot this. That you're yeah. challenged with something, it, it always turns out to be the best mo most of the time. Well, Absolutely. Got a couple of last questions, and then we'll go ahead and let you go. And, take care of uh, your business and your baby. Um, do you have any advice for young ones trying to break into the movie business? Yeah, you know, I would just say, you know, hopefully wherever you are, there's other people that you know that might be interested in, in making a short film or producing some kind of content, whatever that might be, whether it's a music video, a short film, a spec commercial. Um, and I would just say, you know, just, experiment and just shoot as much as you can you know i think the wonderful thing is that it doesn't really cost very much these days to go film something on your iphone or whatever i mean it always takes 
a little bit of effort because you have to like, you know, get the props or get the location or get someone to act in it for you. And it's, it's always, um, you know, a tricky, a tricky thing to organize. But I would just say, shoot as much as you can. Don't be shy about putting yourself out there. Whatever you do, it will always lead you to meet new people. And you don't know when that person is on. It just, um, for me anyway, the way that I got to where I am today was just to shoot everything I possibly could, you know? Um, and that just enabled me to build some kind of reel, which then I was able to, you know, show someone and just say, hey, what do you think of this? Can you let me into your school? Can you, you know, help get me work? Whatever it might be. So I would just say, you know, you need a thick skin in this business, you know? So if you get rejected or you get told no, don't worry about it. Someone else is going to say yes. So just exactly. keep moving forward. Um, believe in yourself and um, just shoot as much as you can. Is there, did someone uh, share any piece of advice or word of advice to you that you could share with, uh, with us? Um, yes, I remember I was working with Wally Fister on Inception. I was his assistant um, and we were in the car together and I was on the phone and um, I was trying to organize, I was trying to organize something on his behalf. And he just said to me, you know what, you can't ask people, you can't be polite and ask people what you want. You just need to tell people what you need. And coming from England, I'm always very polite. And I think, you know, I would do well to be a bit more direct sometimes um but i think you know you just got to tell people what you need from them um and hopefully you know they will give it to you um finally is there any upcoming uh shows or movies or projects that you are able to talk to us about um yeah i mean i just uh you know i the last movie i did was the sequel to a quiet place so um that was supposed to be released in March. It was postponed because of the pandemic. So I believe it's gonna be released in September. Um, but that is a very, very exciting film. Um, it's, a really, it's a really good movie. So it was yeah. one of those movies that challenged me um, and I'm very proud of it. And I'm proud of all the work that all the crew did on it because it was, um, it's a lot of fun and a lot of action and a lot of emotion. Um, and I think, you know, everybody will enjoy going to see it. Yeah, was that, is that your first um, suspense or horror movie that you've done? No, I've done quite a few horror movies. Um, okay. I, you know, so it's, it's, it's fun doing horror, but I wouldn't say this is necessarily a horror. It's, um, it's really more of a family drama wrapped up in sort of uh, action horror. Um, but if, if anyone listening out there is scared of horror movies, I wouldn't be scared. It's, it's not a horror movie as such. Yeah, we, the first one was just done so well. Did you find it challenging to, because they use a different DP for the, for the first movie, did you find it challenging to re step into that, into his shoes and try to find the same balance or same pace that he set in the first movie? Uh, well, it was a female DP who did the first movie. Okay, okay. Uh, so I was stepping into her shoes, but um, no, not at all. I mean, I think that her work on the first one was so beautiful. Um, and I just was really conscious of the fact that I wanted it to feel like a direct continuation. Um, and I wanted to respect the look um, that she had established. So um, no, I mean, the only challenging thing I really sort of, um, that made me nervous was the fact that we shot it on film and I hadn't shot film for about six or seven years. And so that was, you know, I just had to relearn that craft a little bit. But um, other than that, no, I, I, uh, I wasn't nervous. The uh, last question I'll let you go. Um, which do you find more challenging, filming on stock on film or uh, digital? You know what? I think they're very different animals, but um, I really enjoyed the process of shooting on celluloid and not having to be in a DIT tent and you know having that mystery of looking at an image on a very blurry monitor and no one quite knowing what it was going to look like and and then getting the dailies and and seeing that you know everything came out the way that I had imagined so it was a very rewarding experience I really hope that I get to shoot on film again. Um, 
uh, would you recommend people starting out to start work with film on, on film projects? Uh, no, not necessarily. I think that um, anybody starting out should just work on whatever projects they can and not worry too much about the, the technical aspects of it. You know, I think cameras are a dime a dozen these days. You know, there's, there's lots of different cameras out there. Um, and, you know, it's that kind of old saying that it doesn't really matter what you're using, it's what you do with it. So, um, you know, I think as a young filmmaker, I would get my hands on whatever camera I could and I would like read up and explore lenses and, and just really learn like the different glass that's out there of sharper glass or softer vintage glass and kind of learn about what different focal lengths look like, like shoot a close up on a 14 mil and then shoot the same frame on a 50 and just see how different they are and how you respond differently to it. Um, and then lighting, you know, I think that's something that just try and be aware of it as often as possible and, and look at the world around you. Um, but I wouldn't, too, I wouldn't worry too much about film or digital. Okay, great. Well, that's, uh, that will wrap this up. We wanna thank you, uh, Polly Morgan, for giving us, giving us your time. And uh, it was great chatting with you. It was great. It was a learning curve for myself and hopefully for those watching. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. Take care. Right. You take care too. Bye. Bye.